live and insects are animals just like we're animals and they are going to need three things to survive essentially well four technically they need food they need water they need a place to live and then of course they need others of their kind to procreate but if you have the first three then you usually have more than one and so you get that other one so when we're dealing with any type of trying to attract those insects in we want to think about that we want to make sure that we are providing them with those resources and so usually when people think pollinators they think what bees but oh nice bees but what are you trying to provide for them you're going to give butterfly garden and then what are you providing in that butterfly garden that's too much. Raise their young. Raise their young, yes. So you're providing food. You're providing shelter. Do you have water? Yeah. yeah. All right. And then, see, you're good. Right. Awesome. So when you're thinking about adding flowers to attract pollinators, pollinators aren't just bees and butterflies. We also have flies that are pollinators. We have beetles that are pollinators. We have some ant species that are pollinators. So there's a whole bunch of different insects that are out there that can help us pollinate our plants. And actually a lot of those, possibly flies or uh, the native bees, because usually when people think bees and pollinators, they think of a honeybee. That is not a native insect. But we do have tons of native bees that a lot of people don't really pay attention to. And they, they need as much attention and protection and care as the honeybees do. So when we're thinking about these insects, we need to think about different flower types. And you're going to have, essentially, I have broken it down into two categories. We have the open access, and that's going to pretty much let anybody in there. So a rock rose is a really good example of that. It's just open, here's my call, and come on in. And <coughs> so they are not really efficient at directing the pollen onto the insect. So they can go in there and they're, they're just, it's like a big old sign, hey, come over here. And so these type of flowers are gonna need a lot of insects visiting them to get enough pollen and spread that around to the different flowers for pollination. When we're talking about restricted access, so I can't tell what that is, that's a um, Duranta, I think. Um, so this is going to be a specific shape and it's going to specifically direct that pollen onto whatever insect is coming in based upon how it lands on the flower and where the mouth parts are stuck in and all that stuff. And so it will oh, usually put the pollen on good. some specific location. So these ones are very accurate at getting pollinated because it's like, okay, you came here, you get the nectar reward, I'm putting the pollen on you, and you're gonna take it over to the next place and it's going to pick that pollen up. And so it knows that it's getting that pollination occurring. So you're gonna want more than one type of flower in case you didn't get that pollination. So when we're also thinking about plant types, we need to think about a variety because not all of these insects are going to be focused, or, or all the life stages even, are going to be focused on nectar. I mean, that's the other thing that usually people think about pollinators, and it's like, oh, well, they need nectar. Not necessarily. Sometimes they're eating the pollen because pollen is protein, and then the nectar is going to be the sugar. But we also have things like butterflies. The immatures of butterflies are caterpillars. And so caterpillars, don't eat nectar. They, they don't care about nectar. They're eating the plant. And so that's when you have to think about not only the flower part of it, you have to think about what their host plant is and make sure that they have that stuff. So when we're providing things like pollen and nectar and host plants, you want a variety. And especially which, with butterfly gardening, there are grasses, there are trees, there are, you know, herbs and flowers and there's just tons and tons of stuff out there that are going to be host plants 
for those particular. Did you guys need to see my beautiful face? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so there are uh, a bunch of different types of plants, not just flowering plants in the traditional sense that you can use to bring pollinators in. So you need to make sure that you have things in your yard that are gonna provide food for those pollinators that you're attracting from spring through fall. Winter time, you know, sometimes it's nice to have something in there, but that's most of the pollinators hopefully are overwintering. <laughs> and so it's not as important um, you also want to clump, so you can see here how we're not planting just, and I'm really terrible at doing this, because I'm like, ooh, I have this plant, and this plant, and this plant, and so I don't clump a lot. Uh, I'm trying to get better, but you want to plant maybe like three to five of the same plant in one location. That way you have that big pop of color, because those insects are going to be drawn into the plant by the color, by the shape, by the smell. And so if you have more of that in a particular area, it makes it easier for those insects to find that particular plant. You also make sure that you are going to have a um, varied height. We'll talk more about that later. And then also a variety of colors and flower shapes. And we'll talk about the different flower shapes in a minute. And then, of course, you don't want to put pesticides on your plants if you are trying to bring in the insects. You know, I always, always, I'm an entomologist, my husband is an entomologist, my husband works for a pest control company, mm -hmm. and everybody's always just like, what do you guys do at your house to control, you know, whatever. <laughs> we generally don't do anything. That The only thing I could really say that we manage for is fire because I'm allergic to fire ants and they need to be gone off my property. Um, not always successful at that, but you know, we're pretty good. And then of course cockroaches, my husband's not a huge fan of cockroaches, which is humorous for anybody in this room that really knows me or has listened to me speak before, you know I'm obsessed with cockroaches and I love them. And I have a tattoo of a cockroach. <laughs> and so it's this like love-hate relationship with my husband, but you know, if he sees a cockroach in the house or something, if he doesn't kill it, then I can come and catch it and throw it outside, but you know, it, it is what it is. So we really don't do a whole lot for managing stuff. Um, it, it, it's just the way it is. Um, okay, so flower shapes. We have tubular flower shapes. So these are going to require insects that have longer mouth parts. So butterflies, moths, a lot of the bees are going to have those longer uh, mouth parts. So you can see we have our, our cute little bumble over here. Um, we have a lysenid, uh, what are the, the um, hair streaks, there we go. Sorry, I'm, it's hard for me sometimes to think of normal names for stuff. <laughs> so I gotta get into that name. And then um, this one here, we have a fly. Is that a fly? That is a fly. No, that's a bee. That's an anthropoid. So we're going to have these uh, tubular flower shapes that are going to have those elongated mouth parts that need to reach down in there to get that nectar. A ray or a flat flower shape, these are going to, again, this is an open access. Anybody can come in and hang out. So we have bees that get in here. We have flies that can get in here. A lot of times people see beetles, especially um, there are some flower scarab beetles that we'll get into, and they, they're like rolling around in the pollen. They're just so incredibly cute. And then there's also another little tea tiny beetle that's called a tumbling flower beetle. They're absolutely adorable, and you could just imagine with their name how cute that they would be. It's just they're adorable. Uh, we have umbels. So essentially, these are clusters of tubular flowers. So things like yarrow and stuff like that. So these can be accessible to more than just the butterflies and the bees with the longer mouth parts because the tube of the flower is going to be shorter and it also has a larger surface for those insects to land on because a lot of times with those tubular flowers, 
since they're cone-shaped, it's really difficult for like a big fat beetle to land on it because it's gonna miss or fall off or something. <laughs> but if you have smaller, um, like the umbels, it's easier for those to go in there. So you see this one here, this is one of our fly pollinators, and this not only goes to nectar, but this also goes to carrion. This is a, this is a blowfly. And, you know, so this is one of those that a lot of people don't really think about. Oh, that's not a pollinator, that's gonna be on dead things. Yeah, well, there's a lot of those that do both. So, you know, you, you might not wanna to touch those ones. You never know where they go. Um, and then, of course, we have other. There's a whole bunch of different stuff. So we have like a passion vine. I think this is like a pea. This one's a turk's cap. So we have those whorls. You can actually see in this one over here the, the bee that's actually crawling into the little turk's cap flower. So these shapes are going to be accessible to the, obviously, passion flower is going to be accessible to everybody because it's just like, but it's got that funky spaceship stuff. Um, but these ones, you know, if they can access it, it's going to be better for smaller beetles or smaller flies, but they're still going to be able to get in there. Um, if you're talking about larger beetles, probably not, but you do have that wider variety of insects that can get in there. So this is just an example of the different clumps that you have. So we have our lambs here and salvia and all that good stuff. But you can see there's different colors, there's different heights of the plants. So, and there, there's gonna be a lot of shelter in here. So we have shrubs, we have trees over here, which you can't really see the top of, um, ground cover. So that is the kind of layering that I'm talking about. You want that clump, but you also want different heights to draw those insects in. So if you need help on host plants, um, the Wildflower Center does have a way that you can sort things out by all sorts of stuff. And you can actually search one that has uh, butterflies and moths, I think is what that the little thing stands for. And then of course the Xerces Society has a ton of publications <coughs> on um, pollinators. And then of course we, we have some the AgriLife, I don't know if you guys have been on, but the AgriLife Bookstore website has actually finally been redone. So you can actually find stuff now. So you can also go on there and look. So that's fantastic. What do you Google for that? Uh, AgriLife Bookstore. Okay. So if we're talking about post plants for the foliage, this is really going to be dependent upon what insects you're trying to, I guess, draw in or grow in this case. And if you are somebody who doesn't want your plants eaten, this isn't going to be for you because these insects are coming in to eat your plants. So I, I actually had somebody several years ago, they had a butterfly garden. They're like, you know, I have all of these things that I sprayed my butterfly garden because it was being eaten by all of these caterpillars. And I'm like, Huh? <laughs> You're not going to have very many butterflies. Like that is the immature stage of the butterfly that you just killed. So don't spray your butterfly garden. Um, but this is really going to be dependent upon what you are wanting. So if you're going for things like queens or soldiers or monarchs, any of those, those are all milkweed caterpillars. So plant some milkweed into your yard. Hopefully you all do that because there's that whole bring back the monarchs project. Um, if you want gulf fritillary, those are really good for passion vine. If you grow passion vine, you will have tons of fritillaries on there. And then if you like the swallowtails, a lot of them are going to be on things like rue, dill, parsley, fennel, all of those. I usually, I try to trick them and I, because I, I don't like fennel, I don't like that flavor, um, but I love dill. So I always try to plant the fennel in one location and then the dill in another location and then I can transfer the caterpillars over to the fennel so I can have the dill and they can have the fennel. It doesn't always work, but it's worth a shot. There are also some small tails that will get on citrus. A lot of people send me pictures of their citrus trees. 
and they're concerned about the caterpillars that are on it. So usually my answer in that case is if you're worried about your citrus, like the foliage, like being completely defoliated, which I don't think ever really happens with those, then you would need to do something about the caterpillars. But if you don't mind a little munching on the citrus tree, then you can just leave them there and you'll have those swallowtails. So just, you know, ton of different plants. I I'm not gonna name them all. Oh, I do wanna point out this one right here because this is another one that I get. This can be a pollinator, it's a predator but it can also be a pollinator too. This is a robber fly, and they are, you can see there, it's getting nectar out of that flower, but they have those great big hairy bodies, and they also have like great big scary mouth parts that they'll use to stab into other insects and kill them and eat them and stuff, so those are great to have in your yard. They're, they're fun to watch. <laughs> um, okay, so shelter. When we're providing them a place to live, this can be something, I guess as fancy as you want to make it. I, myself, don't get too terribly fancy in my yard, um, but I'm also lazy. So this is where that planting and layers is going to play in. And this is something that when you are starting a landscape, you really need to think about. You know, you want that mature stuff to be higher in the back and lower in the front, that way you can actually see everything. Which, you know, I'm kind of good at doing that sometimes, but sometimes I'm really terrible, and then you gotta move things around, just kind of terrible. Um, but trees, you want shrubs, you want, um, of course, grasses. And when I say grass, I don't mean St. Augustine, I mean like muley and stuff like that. Um, and then you can also do like herbs and vegetables and flowers and chunk those all in. You can either have a separate place or you can put them in with your other landscape. This one is probably the largest one here. I am really good at the second one, leaving a little mess. I am great at that. So it's just that, you know, you've got that kind of brush pile in an area and you've got your compost pile and just twig bundles and just kind of leaf litter. My leaf litter, it always stays on the ground. I mean, it's just one of those, I'll rake it by the trees and it stays there. And then it gets covered with mulch the next year and voila, it's breaking down and it's doing its thing. But that leaf litter is going to provide an area for those insects to overwinter or hide in. Using rocks and then also having bare soil. I always try to make sure that I have an area that is in the sunshine that is bare soil. It doesn't have grass, it doesn't have mulch, it doesn't have plants. And what I'm trying to do there is encourage the solitary bees. So a lot of these native bees, they're solitary, they will do what we call aggregation and they will have those little ground nesting holes in the same area, but they are not social like we think of, of a honeybee or a fire ant or a termite or something like that. So they're going to be nesting in the ground. We have probably, I would say more than 80% of the native solitary bees nest in the ground. And so if you leave them that bare soil with sunlight on it, it's going to be a great thing for them. And then you can also do artificial habitats. And this is something, if you guys work with any kind of kid groups or if you have um, booths when we get back to normal, you can do this with kids and it's really easy to do. I'll show you an example um, of an artificial habitat that I did with a bunch of kids and we had a great time. So this is a portion of my front yard and you can see that it does not look like this anymore after the freeze at all. <laughs> um, but you can see I have different layers on here and you know I, I have the grass I am slowly getting rid of more and more of my turf which is amazing. I love it. Um, but you want those different layers. So I have like really tall trees and then I have some shorter ones and then we have the shrubbery and then more ground cover. And so it's layers. So you want those different levels for those insects so they can have that shelter. So nesting sites, when we're doing this, 
We talked about bear patches of ground. You can see I'm really good at that because of the grass dies. It's like, oh, there's a bear patch of ground. We're good. Uh, you can have bricks or dried mud if you want to make something out of that. My son, he collects clay when we go to the beach. And it's like in the, I don't know, the, the canal area or whatever. And he'll collect that and bring it home. And he starts creating stuff with it. So it's like, oh, you can have a little house for the bugs. We're good. But this is just something, some bricks that we had in the backyard. And we kind of stack those up. And stuff can nest in there. It may not necessarily be what you want it to be. Because sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. It just depends. Um, this was in my yard for a really long time. But it's finally gone because we have a rat problem now. <laughs> so we got rid of it. But this, a brush pile or like twigs or a snag or something like that. If you have enough property that you get it away from the house. That's a great place for things like bumblebees to nest in. So those are fantastic to have. And then these are some of the um, things that you can buy for different types of native bees. So these are mainly, we're looking at mason bees, uh, which are the, like a blue orchard bee is a type of mason bee, or uh, leaf cutter bees, depending upon the size of hole that you're dealing with. And when we're dealing with those, they are going to need specific requirements, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So this is something else that I get questions about a lot. If you're seeing this in your landscape, this is a good thing. I know that it, it's damaged to your plants, and they're cutting these little circle holes out of it, but those are leaf cutter bees that are doing that, and those are one of our native pollinators. And essentially what they're doing is they will collect pollen and nectar from the flowers and they wrap it up in this little packet and then they lay an egg on it and then they wrap it up in the little leaf and they tuck it into a little hole and then they seal it off once they get that whole entire thing filled up. And so they're essentially creating a little nursery for their bees. So if you see this, that means that you have native pollinators in your yard. So this should be something that you get excited about when you see. Okay, so the bee box. Um, when we're dealing with bee boxes, this is really going to be dependent upon what outcome you're trying to achieve because you need to have specific hole sizes, you need to have particular depths, um, and then you want to make sure that you're using the right materials. So there are a lot of bees that you can see. These are really easy to make. These are a four by four essentially, and you just drill holes in them. And then you put like a little roof looking thing on the top and you can set it out, clean it up, or do whatever you want with it. Perfectly fine. That's not gonna be a problem. The, the only issue is you're not gonna get females out of this because when you're wanting the female bees, they put the females, the fertilized eggs, go further towards the back because they're more protected. Um, one, they're more protected. And that way, if something comes and is eating the developing bees from the front of them, they're getting the males. And they usually lay more males than they do females. But it also serves the purpose of allowing those male bees to be the first ones out to emerge. And then they are going to be waiting for the females when they emerge from those nests. So if you want females, it has to be usually about five to six inches. Usually I try to aim for six to eight inches of depth. You don't want the hole to go all the way through. You do want to back on it. That way they're protected back there. And the big thing here, this is another one. You can't really clean that very well. You want to clean it after a couple of years because you don't want fungus building up in there or bacteria or other disease organisms that can actually cause detriment to that bee population that you're trying to build. So you have things like this, where this is just like a, it's one that I'm not thing. It's like a round plastic container and it has cardboard tubes in it. And so it's really easy when that cardboard tube has had the bees emerge, you just pull that cardboard tube out, dispose of it, and then you can stick a new one in there and it's clean. So if you do this, what you can do is you can actually line these with paper 
if you want. That way you can pull those out and it makes it easier to clean for you. This is the other solution. So this is a wooden house and it's layered. So this is what it looks like together. But when you take it apart, it looks like this. And so you can not only clean it, but you can also take it apart and actually see the beads that are in there that are developing, which is really cool. So when you're doing a bee box, these are going to be for the bees that come out usually first in the year. These are going to be our blue orchard mason bees, our leaf cutter bees, those ones that are our early kind of fruit tree pollinators. And these boxes need to be placed about three to five feet off of the ground. They need to be stable, not blowing around. You can't hang them from a tree branch because that makes it more difficult for those bees to land on there. So you want it on a, a solid mountain surface. Um, make sure that it gets morning sun and that it's in a sheltered location from wind and rain and things like that. So this is the one that I made with a bunch of kids. And this was a really fun project because essentially what I did is I set them up with a can and you can use essentially whatever size can you want. But the cans that I got were like those industrial size, like cafeteria cans. And you just need to make sure that the edges are not sharp, that they're gonna get cut. So you gotta kind of bend those down and whatnot. So I gave every kid a can, and then we just had piles of stuff on, well, we did it on the floor, but you can do it on tables. And so we had shredded paper and toilet paper rolls, pine cones, pine needles, bamboo, uh, what else do we have? Um, there are sticks, of course, the cardboard egg cartons. We had packing material like that. Um, I think it's called Excelsior. Excelsior or something like that. We had Spanish moss. I mean, just <coughs> tons of piles of stuff. And we handed each kid a can and we're like, okay, put, put whatever you want in it, however you want it. And the kids were just like, what? <laughs> so they got to create their own little insect habitat. And so we were telling them about where they can put them then. And the school that I did this at, they were actually planning on keeping the cans at school for a while, and they were going to put them out uh, in different locations. So some on the ground, and then some like sitting up on stuff, and then higher levels. And then going out and kind of doing a monitoring thing every week to see what was going to be coming into those particular cans. Because you're gonna be getting different stuff depending upon what, where you're putting it. I mean, obviously the insects on the ground okay. are going to be a lot different than the stuff that are hanging on a fence. And then the other thing that it's really good for those kids to understand is once you get one thing coming in, you're going to be getting other things. Because usually if you have insects move in, then spiders are going to come in, and then you might get some lizards, you can get some birds. So, you know, it's that whole teaching them about an ecosystem. And if you want to do that in your yard, I mean, I don't care if it's pollinators or just, I'm, I just want anybody to get bugs in their yard. I mean, it's just pollinators, it's kind of like the kicking the door open thing because people can handle those. But for me, it's just like the majority of insects that we have on the planet are either beneficial or they just are there. So they're, they're part of the ecosystem. So they're not something to really be concerned about. Um, so while this isn't necessarily going to be helping pollinators per se, it can draw those insects in. It can uh, be a shelter area for overwintering insects. And you know, some of those might be pollinators. So we talked about leaf litter. So this is normally what my yard looks like in the fall everything, or, or whenever it falls, this is, I think, live oak, so in the spring. <laughs> and I just let everything just kind of fall on the ground, and then I'll just put mulch over top of it. And then in the fall, my, my neighbors have a fir oak that drops its leaves, and so all their leaves, of course, blow into my yard. So I break those up, and those stay over in the overwinter. And I, and I found all sorts of stuff in there. We've had snakes, we've had lizards, we've had tons of bugs. Um, the other thing, other than shelter and food, is water. 
And water is one of those things that a lot of people really don't think about. It's like, well, you know, I, they, they get nectar and then they're having pollen. How do they need water? Insects, since they are so small, they have that water requirement probably more so than we do. It's very important that they maintain that water balance within their body or they're not going to be able to survive because they have a, a larger surface area for their body weight. So they need to maintain that water balance and they actually have particular organs in their digestive tract that help them maintain that and make sure that it's in balance. So they do need water and you can provide it in a variety of ways. And usually this is what people tell me about, at least one of my dogs, of course. Um, I have a pond in my backyard or I have a bird bath in my backyard. That's perfectly fine. And yes, that could provide water for the insects. But the problem that we're dealing with there is it's a large body of water and they can drown in it. I have a, unfortunately, I, I need to do a video for my YouTube channel on this because I have a bucket of water on my front porch. It's actually uh, for my pottery, so it's my slip bucket. And I left it on the porch and there are actually insects floating in it. And so I need to do a video and I need to dump it out as well. But when you're talking about larger areas of water like this, it's really difficult for those insects to get to that water and not fall in there unless you have a lot of vegetation like this. You know, if you have a big open pond, that's gonna be different. And then the other problem that you can run into is if birds are at the bird bath and an insect comes in, depending on the bird, that insect might be eaten. Same thing with what you might have in the pond. If you have fish in that pond, it might get eaten. <coughs> so when I'm talking about providing water for insects, I mean providing it specifically for them. And, you know, this is why people think that I'm nuts, which is fine. So it doesn't take a lot. You can take anything that will hold water, essentially, and make it into something that is going to be safe for those insects to use. You can put sand in it. You can put those little glass beads in it from the craft store, of course, army men, because I have a kid. Um, this one, if you're not wanting to fill the water up on a regular basis, this is something that you can do. Get one of the auto watering things and put the stuff in the bottom dish there and then it, you don't have to fill it up as often. I did make an improvement on this. I need to get a new, new picture. So I peeled off the label and I put a piece of painter's tape on the back and then I painted this top part, and I painted mine blue because I wanted to draw in the ones that are attracted to blue, so I picked a blue plus I like blue. Um, but if you want, you can do yellow, you can do red, whatever. Uh, it all depends on what you want to try. But I painted that, and then once it dried, I peeled off that painter's tape on the back of it where it's flat, and that allows me to see the water level. But it helps to reduce the algae that builds up in there because that sunlight isn't going inside. So these are some more. This is a downspout in my backyard. So this is just to slow the water and hold it so those insects can get in there and actually drink it. This one's just a cast iron pot that I have in the backyard. And you just throw some rocks in it. Big old rock, you know, that one I don't have out of my yard, so. It's real easy to get the materials. And then this one, if you want to do something a little more fancy, this was done by a friend of mine, and she actually took a bucket and put uh, cement in there and mixed, or it's probably quick for you if I have to be honest, and then put some shells and stuff in there, but they put a hole in it so they can put a drip sprinkler head in there. And so that essentially will just drip water onto that surface. So again, there's a very small amount of water being provided for those insects. So it's really easy for them to access it. Some other ideas, uh, a lot of people have chickens. Insects can get into those chicken watery things. Um, this 
This one is another huge one. Hummingbird feeders, insects are going to go to hummingbird feeders. That is essentially you providing them with nectar. And while this isn't necessarily water in this case, um, you can put water in those for insects. Um, or you can put hummingbird stuff in there and they'll go to it when nothing is blooming. And the only way to get rid of bees that are at your hummingbird feeder is to take down their hummingbird feeder. Okay, that's, I get that question all the time. The bees are on my hummingbird feeder, what can I do? Take it down, oh, whatever. <laughs> Whoever told you that is a very good salesperson. Um, so this is another, if you want a garden project to do, this is something that I did in my yard. I have now dismantled it because it rotted. Um, this was a soaker hose, and I just spiraled it, and I connected the layers of hose together with zip ties, and I put some potting soil in it, and I put some plants in it, and it was hooked up to the garden hose thing there, and so when I turned it on, not only did I water the stuff that was in there, but you also have that water on the outside that makes it real easy for insects to get that water to drink. The other thing, if you want to get a little spikier than just providing water, this is good for butterflies, but other insects will also come in here. This is called puddling. So this is something that they naturally do around mud puddles, and what they're doing is they're trying to get the minerals and salts out of the the mud and all that stuff, so that's why they're going around those areas. So you can create your own cuddling dish, and that's what I did here. I just took a big flat saucer, and I put some sand in it, and I put some compost in it, and I put some soil in it, and then I just created a little divot, and it gets water, and I have a rock there for them to sit on, and so they can go in there. And you want to put it in a sunny area, of course. And then this is one of those, if you, this isn't something that you leave out for a long period of time, um, because usually that starts growing in mammals that you might not want in your yard. But if you want insects, um, you can put this out during the day, again, in a sunnier area. But just put out a dish with bananas or orange slices or pears or whatever. You can actually see there's a, a fly over here. Again, not what people think of as a pollinator, but it is. So other possibilities, um, this is another way that you can food, feed stuff if you're concerned about mammals carrying away your food. You can use the suet baskets and put things like orange slices in there or melon slices or anything like that. You also want, um, I try to have bare patches of ground in the, I guess areas that get irrigated on a somewhat regular basis. I have this area in one of my front beds that I don't mulch, and I do that specifically for the mud daubers. That way they can come in and get mud to create their nests. And so I, and I can take pictures, as you can see. You also want basking areas for insects. They are not warm-blooded like we are, so they do need to warm themselves up in the sun on cooler days to make sure that they have kind of that warmth that they can actually use those muscles properly. So you can do that by providing some logs for them to rest on or a rock in a sunnier area of your yard or you know sometimes they'll just be on the side of your house if you have a light colored facade. That's also going to work. So essentially food, water, shelter. You want a variety of things throughout the season, so that would be spring through fall. And then, of course, let nature be nature. This is one of those things that people try to manage things so often that they want things, they have in their brains that they need it to look a specific way. And it's not always going to work that way because insects are going to move in, you're going to have other animals move in, and, you know, that, that's... That's nature, and hopefully that's why you guys are gardening and you're outside, because it's something that you enjoy. So enjoy the process. So this is my information. Um, since we have moved into COVID times, I have done um, more outreach. Not, this is like my first talk that I've done in person since, I think, October. <laughs> It's been a really long time since I've been in a room of humans listening to me. Um, 
So I've been doing a lot of stuff. I do post my videos on, they're on Instagram. They also get posted on my Facebook page, which I don't think it's the Urban Hiding at 5 p.m. pages, but if you find this, you'll find me. Um, and, but I do have a YouTube channel. If you Google Wizzy Brown on YouTube, then you'll be able to find me. Um, and these are really short, short videos. I try to keep them about a minute in length. You know, short attention spans. These are just kind of like very small snippets of information. And then the latest and greatest for us is myself and some colleagues have started doing podcasting because it was recommended by our administrators. So we have two that I'm involved with. One is called Bugs by the Yard, and we're covering stuff in the landscape, both pests and beneficials. And then our other one is dealing with structural stuff, and that one is called Unwanted Guests. So this one in Bugs by the Yard, we have, I think our fourth episode just came out last week. And then our Unwanted Guests one, that one should be posted our first episode, hopefully by the end of this month. So if anybody has any questions, then let me know. I'm happy to talk. I tried to leave some question time. Yes? the suet basket because it was like on the, the squirrels were just like taking everything and I was like all right this this has got to stop so yeah I mean, that's a great idea it was great yeah yes. yes I'd like to do the pollinator habitat with my It's just one of those, it's 
cyclical and we never know when it's going to occur. Where, and it, it's definitely in pockets because, you know, I have them in my trees, but I've had people send me pictures and they are just covering everything. It's crazy. But the other caterpillars that I have been seeing around my house are the forest tent caterpillars. Those ones get, and I do videos of that one. So if you go to my YouTube channel, they're right here. There is information about spring canker worms and forest tent caterpillars, and next week will be the third one. So the forest tent caterpillars, that's another one that's going to feed on broadleaf trees. They're defoliators, but they are going to create a mat of silk, usually on either the trunk or on the larger branches of the trees. And so if you need to do something about them, then you can just spray that. But again, you know, generally you don't have to worry about your trees. And then the other one that is really annoying to me, um, the snout butterflies. You guys know those ones that do the whole migration in the fall, but they go that way. I know you guys get them around here because I've driven down here and they're like hitting the car like mad. Yeah, they're, like they're like brown and orange and cream and they have those big labial palps that make it look like they have a long nose. So those are the snout butterflies. Those caterpillars are like falling on me constantly. And they're like a pudgy, yellowish green caterpillar. But they, they have more pro legs than the pink ones. So those are the ones that I have been seeing. There could possibly be more because there are tons of caterpillars. <laughs> Any other questions? About, it doesn't have to be about pollinators, it could be about whatever. Yes, that is okay. So the the donks or the donut thingies, that is it's the Silicerium gensis is really gensis, and it targets caterpillar caterpillars. That's for stocky. Let's go to this one. Israeli gensis targets mosquitoes, mosquito larvae, midge larvae, and black fly larvae. So it's not going to affect the other stuff that's in there. So you could also add fish in there, of course, to help control it. Um, it, it can be the official Gambusia mosquito fish, or you could just go buy some feeder milk fish and chuck those in there. It all works. But yes, that's going to be fine. I use those dunks in my uh, rain barrel because my screening, uh, my husband has been going to fix it for three years now and hasn't. Um, <coughs> So I'm using it there. But when you're using the dunks, it is not the depth of the water, it is the surface area that you're going by. So you don't have to worry. It could be 10 feet deep, it could be 2 feet deep. You're going by surface area. All right, yes? Uh, so I read, not sure if you right, but um, flies don't like lavender. I heard, right? Okay. But, like, is that like, is that like a way of like, Keeping flies away from bringing in other types of pollinators? If you plant your entire yard in lavender, it might do something, but I don't think that it's going to do as much as you hope. Yeah. Um, and you know, why would you want to keep flies away? There's a lot of great flies out there. I mean, mosquitoes, yes, but you know. Some of the other flies are super cool. I mean, you know, there are surface flies that are actually pollinators, so that would be great. I'm sorry? Then, you know, cover your food up. And if you don't want mosquitoes on you, then wear some repellent. And you can actually get some fans. And that way you can have the air moving through there. And that really helps a lot. 